an effort like the development of a vaccine or carbon sequestration uh, technology. Indigenous scholar Kyle White notes the limitations of embracing a crisis epistemology which seeks a clear instrumentalist solution to a problem based, in t um, based on conceits of certainty rather than embracing an integrated view of ecological complexity with an eye toward genuine restoration, sustainability, and justice. If crisis epistemologies lack creative and nuanced engagement with possible futures, they easily perpetuate, if unintentionally, destructive colonial industrial growth paradigms that have brought humans into conflict with the biosphere. White proposes an indigenous informed coordination epistemology based on recognition of kinship and ancestral relations between humans and non-human animals and interdependent moral bonds. While there's much overlap between understandings of interdependence and non-harm to sentient beings in both Buddhism and elements of White's ordination epistemology, my focus here today will be on comfort with uncertainty. The value of uncertainty is manifest in Buddhism as a recognition of the nature of samsara as marked by impermanence and comes out explicitly with the don't know mind, Bujirshin, of the Chan tradition. This paper will explore the potential for Buddhist comfort with uncertainty to provide an antidote to the instrumentalist conceit of certainty and open a space for transformative activism. After outlining the problems associated with certainty, I will explore how Buddhism and Buddhist communities are cultivating forms of uncertainty as a prerequisite for social and political engagement. So our starting point then is why is certainty problematic? So certainty inhibits creative and sustainable solutions by failing to recognize systemic complexity and genuine unknowns. It thus risks perpetuating mindsets and strategies that have produced the current ecological crisis. Certainty also plays a critical role in presumptions around failure, as well as debilitating inaction. It fuels inaction by leading to despair. Despair can be understood as a sense of hopelessness precipitated by defeatist attitudes built on conceits of certain failure or doom. Certainty is also behind the burnout that activists feel when they meet with repeated failures. If they seek victory in their cause, they will perhaps naturally be dispirited after defeats and setbacks, a situation that is simply not sustainable for long-term movements. Finally, a desire or need for certainty has been implicated in the spread of conspiracy theories and related forms of denialism, most recently around climate, vaccines, masks, and voting in the US. Given the various obstacles to acting on climate that are related to this need for certainty, cultivating wise forms of uncertainty may be seen as a critical requirement for building sustainable support for effective climate action. Contemporary Buddhist scholars and communities in North America have promoted this attitude of don't know my as a component of Zen wisdom, as well as a prerequisite for moral engagement and activism. Bernie Glassman emphasized not knowing as a prerequisite for social justice actions undertaken by the Zen peacemaker order. David Loy of the Rocky Mountain Ecodharma Center in Colorado notes that cultivating don't know mind can bring more expansiveness 
that in turn leads to responding appropriately to this ecological crisis. Joanna Macy of the Work That Reconnects Network describes not knowing as a gift, forcing us to be present in the present moment to do what our heart commands. A prerequisite to what she calls active hope. Similarly, Roshi Joan Halifax of the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe has pointed out how don't know mind leads us to a form of wise hope leading to action. She recently wrote um, just a couple of weeks ago, quote, this kind of hope is informed by wisdom and sourced in not knowing or beginner's mind. Paired with don't know mind is a quality of an awakened mind marked by non-attachment to results. Extinction Rebellion Buddhists in the UK note the importance of non-attachment to results on their website. They write, quote, a key offering of the Dharma in the context of direct action is non-attachment to results. This is our perspective. It is free and takes the stress out of our action. Such communities then have seized upon uncertainty as exemplified and don't know mind to transform hope into a new form that ameliorates despair and provides a prerequisite to effective activism. Just as traditions of mental cultivation in Buddhism include the application of antidotes like the Brahma Viharas as um, to counter the hindrances, contemporary communities seem to be applying don't know mind um, as an antidote to uh, certainty. The certainty that has fueled conspiracy theories, denialisms, disengagement, and despair. So we should also ask how is this being done? And if there is any evidence for effectiveness in inspiring activism. So I will um, take this up in the following section by looking at the work of David Loy and Johan Robbins at the Rocky Mountain Eco Dharma Retreat Center, the Zen Peacemaker Order, and Joanna Macy's work that reconnects. So Macy has been running workshops since the early 1980s to cultivate engaged citizens. The work that reconnects is based on a four part cycle. The four parts are beginning with gratitude, honoring our pain for the world, seeing with new eyes and going forth. Seeing with new eyes includes not knowing and non-attachment to results and leads to going forth to work to heal the world. Macy draws from Buddhist teachings, as well as indigenous traditions, deep ecology, systems thinking, and Gaia theory. A model for individual engagement used by Macy is that of the Shambhala warrior. It calls for the arising of warriors wielding compassion and insight to protect and heal the world. Macy points out that the Shambhala prophecy doesn't say what's going to happen. The future is uncertain. Macy describes this not knowing as a gift that enables us to be present, to know what is best. Loy and Robbins have developed ecodharma retreats and hold multiple sessions over the summer to as well as regular programming throughout the year. The Ecodharma retreat is modeled loosely on the cycle of the work that reconnects. The retreat begins with sitting mindfully to become more aware of the natural world through mindfulness of the body. Layered into this are instructions to practice gratitude. Okay, so we, sorry about that. Um, so I was talking about um, the Rocky Mountain Eco Dharma Center and their um, method for cultivating don't know mind. Um, and we were mentioning that after sitting in nature, um, cultivating gratitude, they then share. And after this sharing is 
um, similar to honoring our pain for the world in uh, the Macy um, system. So after this, the participants are encouraged um, to share their, their feelings. And then this is followed by a two night solo retreat to see what arises without an agenda, without expectation. This abandoning of an agenda to see what arises is considered by Loy as cultivation of don't know mind as well as non-attachment to results. After this, the group shares what has arisen and given an opportunity to network with others if interested in working together to address climate breakdown. The Zen Peacemaker Order, founded by Bernie Glassman in 1996, based on three tenets, bearing witness to the joy and suffering of the world, taking action that arises from not knowing, and finally, and bearing witness, and not knowing is thus the pivotal, pivotal component of this um, active agenda. The Zen Peacemaker Order has been engaged with justice, protest, and relief work for more than two decades, including work with immigrants from Africa and the Middle East in Europe. Some support the efforts of Lakota elders to revitalize their language and culture and stood with them at Standing Rock to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. Still others work politically for solutions to climate change. All of these groups then are actively cultivating don't know mind, along with non-attachment to results, to inspire active engagement with the climate crisis and justice work. Arguably the most consequential instance of Buddhist facilitated climate commitments was the 2015 Paris Agreement, which was adopted by 195 uh, nations and was meant to guide economies to a climate safe future. How was it Buddhist facilitated? The Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change from 2010 to 2016 was Cristiana Figueres. Figueres is the daughter of the father of modern Costa Rica, which has no military and generated 98% of its energy from renewable sources in 2020. What is less known is that Figueres credits her negotiating success at the UN to her Buddhist approach. Figueres, a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, speaks of stubborn optimism as necessary for facing the climate crisis. Her advocacy of stubborn optimism is yet another species of the anti-colonialist don't know mind. While media commentators always emphasize the obstacles to reaching agreement, she chose instead to focus on what was possible. She chose to be mindful and not assume foregone opposition or agreement by any nation, rich or poor. It was her deployment of mindfulness and openness to possibilities, which she attributes to success in Paris. So to wrap things up, um, given the growing threat from conspiracy theories and fatalists based on conceits certainty, these Buddhist teachings present a helpful antidote leading to a path of more engagement and humility. White argues the sense of urgency leading to a solution is based on a colonial crisis epistemology that at the end of the day seeks to maintain the status quo and power relations. The Buddhist groups introduced here provide an alternative epistemology marked by not knowing and non-attachment to results. It promises to avoid the pitfalls of this crisis epistemology based on a conceit of certainty. The examples discussed here demonstrate the continuing relevance of don't know mind and non-attachment to results for confronting the existential problems of our times. Thank you.